Welcome to the latest installment of the Option Industry Council's webinar series. My name is Mark Benzquin, and I'm a staff member here at the OIC. We're glad that you can join us to learn more about options as a flexible and powerful trading tool. In our presentation today, What's Behind an Options Price, we'll take an in-depth look from one of the industry's best at various components of options pricing and how they relate to some of the more frequently used strategies. And as always, we'll cover the material and your questions in a quick 60-minute session. I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Mr. Peter Lusk of the CBOE Options Institute. As a senior instructor, Peter teaches a variety of option courses and is presented to thousands across the country. He's also a regular contributor to various financial publications as well as CNBC, and you can catch his Strategy of the Week segment on CBOE TV. We're fortunate at the OIC to call Peter a colleague and a friend, and we're always glad to have him stop by to join us. And as I know that he's got a lot to share with us today, let's get right to it. Peter? All right, Mark. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. And hello again, everybody. It feels like I've been doing a lot of these lately, and I recognize some of the names in, in, in attendance. Now, look, before we start, I want to tell you something. We've got a mixed bag of people on today, which means that we've got the beginners, some intermediates, and some advanced maybe that I might even call on for help, you know. But here's the deal. If you just walk away from today with a couple ideas or maybe even maybe just getting 25% of what I say, that's okay. Don't get discouraged because you know what? This whole game is really all about education and about option pricing. That's really what we're trying to take advantage of anytime we trade options. Think about it. If you're a call buyer, you want that stock to move higher, right? If you're a put buyer, you want that stock to go lower. That's directional trading. How about this? If you're a covered call trader, you're going after time decay. Or how about volatility? Maybe trading around earnings periods or Fed announcements, things like that. So we're always going after the change in an options price. And that's why this webinar today is so very important. Now also, take this in mind. If you like something well enough, you're going to be good at it. That's just how it is with me. And I liked it well enough down on the trading floor, even though I didn't make any money for 13 months. And the OIC's got me talking to you guys today. But then guess what? It did all click after 13 months. It all will click for you too. It typically takes about, I would say, about two and a half years to get this whole game figured out. But not really, because you know what it really comes down to? It really comes down to what is the underlying going to do. You can know all the mechanics of how all the option pricing works, but it really comes down to your forecast for the underlying index or ETF or equity. So let's go and please our lawyers here really quickly as well. We've got uh, a couple disclaimers here, one from the Options Industry Council, and make sure that you understand that options are a wasting asset and they can also be a quite of a risky instrument. All right? So thank you very much for putting up with the disclaimer. Now, once again, i got to tell you, option pricing is a nice, kind way of saying the Greeks. Maybe some of you have heard the term the Greeks. That's all about delta, gamma, theta, vega, and we might even mention rho a little bit, but we don't care too much about rho, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So without further ado, let's kick this thing off. Oh, there's my disclosure. Sure, it says pretty much the same thing as the OIC, which also includes make sure you get a copy of that characteristics and risks of standardized options. Very important. You know why that's important? Because some traders, when they start out, they're so eager just to pull the trigger on the mouse, right, and get in the game. But you really need to understand the risk versus the reward. Very, very important. All right. Let's jump in. Here we go. A little bit of a review for some of us. And for the beginners, that's okay. We're going to kick it off just like this. The price of an option is made up of two things, intrinsic value and time value. Intrinsic value is that in the money amount of an option. And we like to say that anything in excess of that intrinsic value, that in the money amount, we call that time value. Now I'm going to go you know, jump ahead with something very, very advanced here, but that's okay because you need to know this. When we talk about volatility, which we will coming up, just keep in mind that when volatility goes higher, 
both call and put premiums go higher. When volatility goes lower, both call and put premiums go lower. But it's the time value portion that expands or contracts, not the in the money amount. It's the time value. So that's the time value needs to be paid close attention to. Now, I've got a nice little screen to break down intrinsic value versus time value. Here it is. The strike price at the bottom is a 50 strike. The stock, pretty much in the middle of the screen, is at 55. So this 50 strike call option is in the money by $5. The 50 strike climbs up to 55. Yeah, our intrinsic value is $5. And we said that anything in excess of that intrinsic value is time value. So with this being an $8 option, yeah, our time value is $3. And there's the math. $3 in time, 5 intrinsic, our market value of the option is $8. Now, I get the question a lot, Peter, who makes these, these markets? Who makes the prices of these options? We all do. We're all market participants. Think about it this way. Think about uh, Sharon, who lives in Pocatello, Idaho. And she's looking at an, at an option that is 2-bit at 210, but she wants to pay 205. She puts that order in. She's 205 bid for one contract. That flashes all around the world. Now the market is 205 bid at 210. There you go. We all participate. But what it really comes down to when we talk about these option prices is supply and demand. And I'm going to get into a little bit more on that later. Now, here they are. Here's four of the five Greeks, right? We kind of kicked the, uh, the interest rate Greek to the curb because it doesn't have a whole lot of sense when it comes to, to option pricing. But here's the four big ones. Delta, okay, is the impact of the underlying price, the movement of the underlying. Delta is the change in an option's theoretical value for every one-point change in the underlying, whether it be a stock index or ETF. Gamma is going to be the change in delta for every one point move in the underlying. Now, don't go running for the doors yet. We're going to, we've got some good examples of this, okay? I'm just defining it right now. Vega is going to be the impact of volatility. Theta is all about time. Remember, we said these options are a wasting asset. And rho that we didn't include, we didn't include it on purpose. And you know why? The change in interest rates. Well, interest rates don't change very often by a whole 1%. And if they ever did or do, guess what? It's going to be volatility and the movement of the underlying that's going to affect the underlying price or the underlying price of the option, I should say. All right, now, here's the three moving components. And this kind of makes sense when you're planning your trade. And remember, you should have a three-part forecast when you plan your trade. And the first part of your forecast is this. The price of the stock, what's it going to do? Is it going to go higher? Is it going to go lower? Is it going to sit still? Because you know what? We've got strategies for all of that. How long is it going to take for you to realize your forecast? That's time. And how about your expectation of volatility? It's funny because even when I meet intermediate traders, they think they kind of got it all figured out, right? They don't even understand the concept of volatility, and that's sad, but that's why I'm glad that we're all here today because we're going to get the concept of volatility today. So also take a look at this as we break down these moving components. The price of the stock, that's going to be delta and gamma, and I've got an example of delta coming up. How about this? The time until expiration, that's that Greek that we call theta. And how about implied volatility? That's the Greek we call Vega. We're going to go over all four of these Greeks that I just mentioned. And I've kind of simplified it, kind of dumbed it down, and I hope you get it. But like I said at the beginning, if you just walk away with a couple, two, three ideas, or maybe you just grasped about 20% or 25% of what I've said today, consider that a home run because it does take time. There's a lot of moving parts with options. This is not just buy low, sell high, but I guess that's what makes option trading so fun. Now, here we go with the concept of delta. Remember I said that delta is the change in an option's theoretical value for every one point change in this stock that is trading 30. 
Now, ITM, that is in the money on the left-hand side. I just lit it up. There we've got the 27, 28, and 29 strike calls. With the stock trading 30, those call options are below the stock price, so therefore those call options are in the money. All right? Now, take a look at the deltas. The in the money call, the 27 strike call, is in the money by more than, uh, well, it's in the money by $3, but it's in the money more than the 28 or 29 strike call, so it's going to have a higher delta. So we also look at delta as probability. Take a look at the at the money call option. The delta of the at the money call is 50. So we believe that this call option has about a 50% chance of being in the money at expiration, whereas the 27 strike call has about an 85% chance of being in the money at expiration. And look, if Mark said to me, hey, Peter, you want to go to the Cub game? The Cardinals are coming to town this weekend. Well, you know what? I might give him a delta of a zero or maybe even the 25. You know why? Because I don't like the Cubs. Sorry about that, Mark. I think you might be a Cub fan. But we look at delta as probability, and that's kind of trader talk that we have down here on the trading floor here at CBOE. But look at the out-of-the-money calls. Yeah, they're just that. They're out of the money. The delta is going to be less than 50. All right? In the money, greater than 50. And once again, when you learn more about option trading, you'll see how we use delta as probability to choose strike prices for various trades. But right now, what you need to know is this. Look, if this stock goes from 30 to 31, that at the money 30 strike call, we would add 50 cents onto the price of that call. And I've got a good example of that coming up. And there we go. Out of the money, deltas are going to be from zero all the way up to one. All right. Now, gamma is the change in delta for every one point change in the underlying. I like this underlying, well, this underlined phrase here where it says, beware of gamma, but do not worry too much about it. That's exactly what the takeaway is for you here. Be aware of it, but don't worry much about it. Just know that delta is going to change when the underlying moves. All right? So gamma is the change in delta for every one point change in the underlying. Now, let's take a look, and we'll put both of these together. Here is gamma. The stock price is 30. The call price is $1.50. And we've got an at-the-money call, so we know that that at-the-money call option has a delta of 50. All right? Now, look, the stock went from 30 to 31. We got that $1 move, so the call price increased by its delta and a little bit of its gamma. You see that delta doesn't stay the same from 30 to 31. That delta slowly increases, and it slowly increases up to 60 right here. See the 60 right there, all right? So stay with me. Now, what happens here? Stock's up a point, call is up 55 cents, the delta's up a dime, see the delta has changed, and the gamma is 10 cents, all right? Now it can go the other way too. Stock's down a point, what happens here? The call price is down 45 cents, and the call delta is down 10 cents because of the gamma. Now I know for the beginners, this is kind of a lot, I don't expect you to get everything right away, but what's nice is Mark said that you can revisit this webcast at some point in time. Come back and visit it, and maybe go over it again. Just like school, you know, you can't just get everything right away, otherwise it's too easy. But what makes it so rewarding is that, yeah, it's tough, and when you get it, it feels really good. All right? So we talked about delta, we talked about gamma, all right? And understand the fact that gamma just happens. Don't worry about it. Just know that delta is going to change when the underlying goes up or down. Now, deltas for calls are positive and deltas for puts are negative. We just left it with the calls today just to kind of keep things somewhat simple. All right. Now, time decay. This is where it gets good. We know already, though, for directional traders, if I buy a call option and the stock goes up three bucks, with everything else being equal, yeah, 
that call option should increase in value based upon its delta and gamma. Stock goes down, we buy a call option, that option is going to decrease in value. So what we're doing right now, we're taking it out of the textbook, right? We're putting it into like a real life concept. So that's delta and gamma. Now time decay is very, very important as well. And theta is the option Greek that we express for time decay. Now, time decay is that portion of the option, right? Out of the money options, all time decay. At the money options, all time decay, all time premium. In the money options, some intrinsic value, maybe all intrinsic value, depending on how deep in the money that option is. All right? So the longer the time to expiration, the greater the time value. The stock price relative to the option strike price also impacts the amount of time value. And remember I said that volatility only affects time value, time premium. Now, let's take a look and see how time decay works. With the stock at 40, Look at, we've got the 36 calls all the way up to the 44 strike calls. So the in-the-money calls have a theta of about 5 cents. Now look, here's the definition. Theta is going to be the change in an option's theoretical value for every one unit change in time. And the unit change in time is a day. So for this 36 strike call, with everything else being equal, this option will lose five cents in value between today and tomorrow. The 38 strike call will lose seven cents of value between today and tomorrow. All right? Now you tell me how much is that at the money call going to lose between today and tomorrow? Yeah, it's right there. I boxed it off for you. It's 10 cents. How about the other guys? Seven cents and six cents. Now let me ask you a question. How come that theta is so great for the at-the-money call and not so great for the 36-strike call or the 44-strike call? Well, it's all about time premium. Here's the deal. That 40-strike call option has the most time premium because it's at the money. So therefore, it's going to have the most theta, the most time decay. So some option traders, when they look to sell options, they want to go after that great theta that where it's going to decay rapidly. All right. We also know that theta picks up steam and accelerates as expiration approaches. Looks like we don't have a, a days till expiration here, but that at the money call, let's just say that it's 30 days to go till expiration. Yeah, it's a 10 cent theta. A week from now, it might be 14 cents. That theta will increase in value as expiration approaches. And I'll show you. A very good picture. I like the pictures a lot. Take a look at this. This is an at-the-money option. At-the-money time decay. On the left-hand side, we've got an option worth about, what, a buck seventy or whatever? And look, there's 60 days to go until expiration on the bottom line, and then 50 and 40 and 30. Notice how this option decays, and with 10 days to go, it's got a very accelerated rate of decay. Wow. Boom. That's how it is. Picture you putting a 10-year-old kid on a sled and pushing him down the hill just like that. It picks up steam as expiration approaches, or at least it gets slippery down that slippery slope of the sled hill, right? So that's another reason why we see option traders targeting weekly options, selling these weekly options to take advantage of that acceleration of time decay. Now, some of you might be aware of a covered call strategy. And what is that for the beginners? That's selling an out-of-the-money option on a stock that just isn't really generating any income, a stock that's kind of sitting still. We're looking to generate some income by selling options, selling time premium. And by tackling or trading options that only have a week of life to them, whether it's this at-the-money option or whether it's one that's a little, little bit out-of-the-money, you're taking advantage of that acceleration of time decay. And if you look at it and really study it, if I sell a 30-day option, I could do that against a stock ownership that I already have, but I could sell four weekly options in that month, in that same month, and that time decay will help me outperform the 30-day option. Very popular strategy now with the weeklies, and that's what these weekly option traders are doing. Here is a uh, out-of-the-money 
time decay and an in the money option with time decay. Less time premium, more of a linear rate of decay, more of a boring sled hill, right? That's just how it works for the picture. All right. Now here is where we separate the men from the boys and the girls from the ladies and so on and so forth. All right. It's all about volatility right here. Now there's two types of volatility. There's historical volatility. That's what the stock has done in the past. We all get that, right? We know that. Keep a journal or keep it in your head. If you're like me, I come from an options pit with 16 stocks. And I knew those 16 stocks better than anybody. At least I thought I did, right? Because I'm not trying to get my arms around 100. And your guy Kramer on TV, you bet. He's got an army of people helping him out. And they do a really nice job of tracking stocks and informing you of what the stock has done and so forth. But for me, it's all about having just a handful of stocks that I trade because then I'm going to be intimate with them. I'm going to know exactly what they've been up to to help me further my forecasting for future trades. So historical volatility is that. It's based on past stock prices. All right. Now implied volatility. That's the expected volatility of the underlying. All right. Only options have implied volatility. And I always like to say I love the word implied. And why is that? Because when I look at the price of an option, it's looking right back at me, right? If that option is pricey, it's pricey for a reason. There's an expectation of significant movement in the underlying. Go see Amazon. Go see Tesla. Go see Chipotle, right? How about Apple in advance of uh, the big powwow meeting they had yesterday? So implied volatility is a great word. Those options are expressing something. They're trying to tell you something. Maybe. How about this? When options are cheap, maybe not so much movement on the underlying. Now, those Apple options in advance of the big meeting they had yesterday that kicked off at noon with the two phones they were talking about, yep, these were weekly options that expire this Friday that were traded very, very heavily. There was an expectation of significant movement in Apple, and a lot of Apple traders chose to sell this intense high premium with out-of-the-money 165 calls. These traders are banging the, these things out by the thousands yesterday, selling these call options for $1.05. Now, these call options were $1.05, and they were about $3.5 out of the money. Pretty rich. And guess what? Those calls, these traders bought those calls back today for $0.10. Cents. I've got more on that if you want to see one of my videos. It's posted on the CBE website. A nice little story to tell from a good trader that traded Apple yesterday all the way up to today. And you know why he's a good trader? Because he's got an expectation of volatility. You've got to have that. Otherwise, you shouldn't even be trading. I would tell you to, to hang it up and turn your computer off. So there was a really good trade that went down yesterday. So to summarize, historical volatility is based on the movement of the underlying in the past. All quantifiable, right? Implied volatility is all about the options. And the options give you an expectation of what the stock volatility will be. So look, even if your neighbor or your wife or your husband, right, let's just say they're stock traders. There's so much you could teach them about options to give them a leg up on their trading of stock because options are trying to express something to you. They're telling you what the volatility just might be in the underlying contract. And Vega is the Greek that we use to indicate how much the option price is going to change based upon a 1% change in implied volatility. And I'll show you. I love talking about volatility. Somebody down here always used to say they love the smell of volatility in the morning. These traders in these pits, they really need volatility. Keep this in mind before we talk about Vega. These traders in these pits, they take the opposite side of all of your trades. But they got to get paid for that, right? And their payment isn't what you think. Nobody writes them a check. What it is, though, is the bid and ask spread. And years ago, the bid and ask spread used to be expressed in fractions. I could buy something at two and sell it for two and a quarter. How about that, right? And now we're talking about buying something at two and sell it sometimes for two and a penny. So these traders in these, in these pits, yep, just like you, they've got to have a big expectation of volatility because that's how they make their money now. It all comes down to being on the right side of volatility, and you need to be on the right side of volatility too. So let's take a look at this slide. This call price is $1.25. 
Implied volatility is 20%. Aha, look what happens. Implied volatility goes up 1%. And we said that Vega is the change in an option's theoretical value for every 1% change in volatility. Here we go, look. Let's go back to second grade. $1.25 plus the Vega amount of 10 brings us to $1.35. The underlying doesn't even have to move. All right? And these options can change in value based upon volatility. How about this? This happened in Apple today. Even though Apple went lower, usually when Apple or any other underlying goes lower, that signifies uncertainty. And volatility is all about uncertainty. But today, a little bit of a different thing. We're certain now about these two phones. We know what they're about. There's facial recognition and so forth. So take a look at this. Volatility goes from 20% down to 19%. Boom. Call price is down 10 cents. Why? We took the $1.25 of the call and subtracted the Vega amount of 10 cents. And volatility in Apple, last time I looked, went down about 12%. All right? So it's very significant. When you're buying volatility, you better be right. All right? Whether it's in advance of earnings or not, you've got to be right. Anytime you buy any options, you're buying volatility. And if volatility goes the wrong way, uh-uh, not good. All right? So that's how Vega works. And once again, volatility can move swiftly, and it can move a lot. And I've got a graph to show you how it can move a lot, especially post-earnings. And keep in mind, once again, volatility is all about uncertainty. We're uncertain about this guy in Korea. Well, we're certain about one thing. We know he's a nut, right? But those things make the markets uneasy along with several other things that we talk about in this uh, wild world of ours. But here's the volatility chart I wanted to show you. And this is on live vol. So take a look. Right in the center, you'll see this is earnings. There's a little E in that little blue box, right? Look how volatility climbs up in advance of earnings, kind of settles, finds a spot. Earnings are released. Bam! Earnings get crushed, right? And we lollygag along. Everything's cool again in the world, cool in the stock. Uh-oh, earnings on the horizon again. We're uncertain about earnings, right? Volatility climbs up higher, higher, higher. And right about here, if I showed you this slide the next day, bam, what happens? Volatility gets crushed again, all right? There's certain trades that we like to do in advance of earnings. On the trading floor, the market makers, they like to sell the heck out of those front month options or weekly options, but they also protect themselves by buying options further out in time. They love selling volatility. And you know what? You need to know what volatility you're selling and what volatility you're buying. Don't kid yourself. These options are not lottery tickets. There's a lot of moving parts, and it's a tricky game. And you know what? It really gets me frustrated when somebody says, oh, those market makers are ripping me off. No, they're not. You don't understand volatility. Because look, you know where I get that comment from? That's somebody that buys 10 call options in advance of earnings, and they're paying for these call options up here. All right? Earnings are good. Stock's up two and a half bucks. Calls are still worth a buck. What happened? Yeah, Delta and Gamma worked in your favor, but volatility got crushed just like this. Volatility was a thief. It took away your gains from the advances of Delta and Gamma, and that's probably what was going to happen here too. So again, hopefully I'm opening up some eyes. Volatility is very real, and it can change in a heartbeat. And boy, have we been in a, a pattern of bullishness since 2009, right? One of these days, one of these days, we'll see, and it'll be headline news, some sort of correction. All right. Now, I love the options calculator. A lot of the trading platforms have it. The OIC's got a great one. And keep in mind, the OIC is just a, a wonderful website. You can search just about anything on the OIC website and some sort of former article or who knows what will just pop up and give you information. It's all right out there. All right? So they've got a calculator too. And what I like about the calculator is this. It's going to show you all the moving parts that we just talked about. All right? I've circled them. Remember the slide where I had the three moving parts? Right here, I'm pointing to it with this little arrow. Price, expiration date, and volatility. When we talk about price, what are we talking about? Yep, over here, delta and gamma. 
expiration. What are we talking about? Time decay, theta. Volatility, vega. All right? So look, the beauty of this thing is this. This is a great teaching tool. You play with it for a little bit, and you can really understand the interplay that happens between all of these Greeks, these pricing factors. The first one would be, and I don't have it live for you, but we can just kind of take a peek here. I can change the price of Apple. I can go from 157.86 to, let's say, 160. And guess what's going to happen? Over here, I'll get a good feel for the call value will increase with everything else being equal. The put value will decrease. Let's just say I go up $1. Look what's going to happen. That call is going to increase by its delta of 53 cents and a little bit of its gamma of about 3 cents. See? And when you play with it, you'll see, you'll be able to say, look, I know what that delta is. I know what the gamma is. If we raise this stock up by a buck, $4.43 on the call, plus about another $0.55, cents, yeah, we're looking at about a $4.95 option. Then you click it on, and you're going to be just about there within a penny. And that'll make you feel good, because now you're getting it. Because look, when I started out, there were no computers. I was like Mark. I had cardboard cards to work off of. Anytime I made a trade, and I would trade several thousand contracts in a day, I had to keep my positions accurate and know my deltas, all right? And you should know them too. Even though you, these answers are given to you on your trading platform, get to know how to figure it out yourself. Once again, that will give you a leg up on your trading. You'll be smarter than the other guy or the other gal. How about this? What if we change the days to expiration? What if we go from September 15, which is this Friday, what if we go out to October? All right? Then what happens? Now we're looking at time decay. That theta will be a little bit less the further out in time we go. Remember I told you that time decay accelerates as expiration approaches. So play around with the time to expiration. And then look at the theta and how much time is going to come off the call and the put. Do it with one day and see how much time is going to come off the call and the put. You'll know because it's about $0.07, cents, which it says right there by the arrow. And how about this one? What if we take volatility from 24%, kind of round it off here, up to 25%? The call and the put will both increase by $0.17, cents, which is the vega. How about you take it up two ticks, $0.34, cents, you see? How about you take it down? You take $0.17 cents away. Now you're going to get it. Now you're going to understand how these options get priced and the interplay that takes place between the delta, gamma, theta, and vega. And now you're going to get good. But <laughs> you still got to remember, it all comes down to your forecast for the underlying. But if you're really good and your toolbox is full of smarts, you're going to have a leg up. It's going to be fine. And it's going to take time, but if you like it, you're going to be good. So that's the options calculator. I like it a lot, and I also like this fact. My mother is a school teacher. Well, not anymore, but she was a school teacher. She's 86 years old now. But you know what? She taught me something a long time ago, and she, well, a lot of things, actually. But she said, you know what? Turn the paper around now and show me what I just showed you with your homework. And then when I'm teaching her, yeah, now it's getting ingrained in my head. You know, the student becomes the teacher. You could do that, too, when you leave these webcasts and these webinars and whatever else you're at, you know. It's nice to go home and say, hey, look, honey, or look, whoever, look what I learned today, you know. <laughs> Just my thoughts. So maybe it's something that you might want to take advantage of. All right. Let's go into this thing now with a couple trades, and let's take a peek at some of these Greeks and see what these options are all about. This is a bull call spread, very popular strategy. And once again, we have a three-part forecast, don't we? When I say, what will the stock do? I wish you were all in the room right now. You'd all shout it out for me. What are the Greeks for that? That's delta and gamma. How long will it take? That's time. And you're going to shout out, that's theta. How about volatility? That's going to be vega, not the car that I remember as a kid. Those are terrible cars, Right? So the forecasts are the foundation of all option trades. Remember that. All right? So you've got to have this three-part forecast. No lottery tickets. Uh-uh. That ain't going to fly with me. Okay? So let's take a look at this bull call spread example. Now look, in my dad's world, 
If he's bullish, what's he doing? He's buying stock. All right, fine. In my brother's world, who knows a little bit about options, he might buy the call. If my dad buys 100 shares of stock at 50, he's into the game for 5,000 bucks. If my brother buys the 50 strike call, knowing that he's in agreement with my dad that the stock's going higher, he's into it for 290 bucks. Because remember, we know that these options, right, they represent 100 shares. It looks cheap at $2.90, but yeah, it's on a per share basis. That's 290 bucks. But $290 in comparison to my dad's five grand, that's a big difference, isn't it? But now we've graduated. We've become spread traders. Why? Well, look, we already know that if I engage into a spread, I'm buying something, I'm selling something. I'm spreading off the cost of getting into the game. My dad's at five grand, my brother's at 290, and I'm at 170 bucks. And that's the most I can lose is the $170. All right? Now let's take you through the rest of the trade. Then we're going to talk about the Greeks because guess what? We are also spreading off the risk of time and volatility to a certain degree. So first of all, we got to know, look, what's what's the most we can lose? All right, we get that. In this trade, it's what I paid for the trade. It's 170 bucks. All right, now where do I got to get this stock to go just to break even? I've got to get this stock up to 5170, the 50 strike that I bought, the lower call that I bought, plus the net debit of $1.70, $51.70 just to break even. Now, the most I can make, I'm capped off now through rights and obligations, right? Remember, if I buy an option, I've got the right to buy shares. If I sell an option, I've collected premium. And because I've collected premium, no rights, but I've got the obligation to sell shares. So I'm capped off at 55. So the most I can make is the difference in the strike prices, which is 10. 55, excuse me, 5, 55 minus 50 is 5, less the dollar seventy. yep, $3.30 or $330 is the most I can make with this trade. So we get that. The risk, 170 the reward, hopefully, 330 And we spread off the cost of getting into the game. But how about this? Let's take a look at two Greeks. We're not looking at the delta and gamma right now. Let's take a look at the vega and theta. Remember, when I buy options, which I am with the 50 call, and I'm long the 50 call, and for the beginners, when I'm long something, that means I bought it, I own it, all right? Well, because I bought that 50 call, I'm long 10 cents Vega, all right? And because I bought that 50 call, <laughs> I've got a negative theta of 3 cents. So that theta is my enemy when I buy an option, right? But look, I've actually shorted or sold a call option. So now I'm short volatility, short vega of eight cents. And because I sold a call, time decay is now my friend. I have two cents profit with that one, well, not profit, but it's a positive two cents on that guy. So here's the point. Overall, we know we spread off the cost of getting into the game. How about this, though? My exposure to volatility is two cents. So if volatility goes higher, that's going to be very favorable for this trade. Not very favorable, but somewhat favorable, right? Two cents, right? Goes up one tick, my spread makes two cents. But how about this? Time decay, a little bit of a thief here, right? My time decay is a penny a day, all right? So this trade will decrease in value each day by a penny if volatility remains constant. So look, look at my brother. If he just bought the 290 call and volatility goes down a tick, He's down 10 cents, two ticks, 20 cents, right? So spreads are nice, spreads are fun, but they do have the trade-offs. And the trade-off of this one is, remember, my profits are capped at 55. But it's important to know that we have spread off the risk of volatility and time to a certain degree. Old saying in the pits in Chicago, when you buy something, you got to sell something. And I got a great story about that, but I don't have time to tell it. It's a really funny, good story. Maybe next time I'll come on and tell you about that. But that was the guy that I lectured one time. I said, look, when you buy something, you got to sell something. You can't be totally long, and you can't be totally short stuff. You'll get killed. Time decay is a slow death. All right, let's talk about the long straddle. All right, here's the deal with this guy. I hate straddles. Why? 
because I know straddles are the expected movement of the underlying, and why would I want to buy the expected movement? Look, for the beginners, yeah, you kind of come up to me every once in a while and you say, I've got this whole game figured out, and I'll say, really, how? And you'll say, well, look, if I buy a call and the stock goes up, I make money. I go, well, yeah, you know, kind of with everything being equal. And if I buy a put and the stock goes down, I can make money. And I go, yeah, you know, whatever. We call that a straddle, all right? We call that a straddle. It's an at-the-money straddle. Now, look what we're doing. Yeah, you need big-time movement in the underlying when you buy a straddle, all right? Because look what you're doing. You're buying all-time premium. This $6.20, that's all-time premium, all-time decay, all theta, right? And I need the stock to go up $6.20 to break even on the upside, down six twenty to break even on the downside. And that, everybody, is the expected movement because you've heard me talk enough. When I'm looking at a stock, I could talk to you long about standard deviation and things, but I'm looking at the straddles all the time because when I add up the fair value of the call and the fair value of the put, that gives me maybe the expected movement of the underlying. And again, I say maybe, but that implied volatility is telling you something. So I don't like to buy straddles at all. I don't like to sell them either because I don't like that naked call. But let's take you through the rest of this trade is this. We need a significant move in the underlying, either up or down. Or how about this? We're long volatility, right? Or we need volatility to pop up big time and we'll make money that way too. Look, I'll show you. Here's the Greeks. We bought options. So we're buying all Vega. We're buying all time decay. Time decay is certainly my enemy here, right? Every day, six cents is coming out of these contracts through time decay. How about this? How about volatility? I'm certainly long volatility. If volatility goes up one tick, 1%, yeah, this position makes 20 cents. But I got to factor in the loss of the theta too, right? How about two ticks and three ticks and so on? So I'm long volatility. So once again, for this trade to work out for me, I need one of two things. Two would be great. A big move in the underlying and a big pop in volatility would be fantastic. And you know what else? If that all happens and this trade is still alive and I've had a move or I've had a big pop in volatility, I'm getting out. Because like the OIC says, Nobody ever went broke taking a profit because you've got your hands on a big bunch of premium here, don't you? All right? So now is the happy time. And you know what the happy time is? It's all about giving you guys a quiz. Yep, because too much, just like some parent today that, that will say, you know what? You guys have everything handed to you. Can I use that line on you guys today? Maybe I can because you know what? These trading platforms... Oh, my goodness, they give you really more things than you need. I sometimes think that a lot of traders have information overload, and it makes them overthink things. It really does. It really comes down to what we talked about most of the day, which is option pricing. We want to take advantage of option pricing. So here's the quiz. I want you to tell me what the Greeks are of this position. This is one more bull call spread. Again, the stock is at 90. I'm buying an at-the-money call, and I think the stock is going to go up to about 96. And why do I think that? Well, maybe I'm looking at the at-the-money straddle. If I'm looking at the at-the-money straddle as I make this up right now. I'm looking at probably an $8 move, and this guy's looking at about a $6 move. And that's okay because they're collecting this $1.73. Not a bad thing. Maybe they're not as greedy as I. So what we're trying to do is find out if the, if the delta, gamma, vega, or theta are positive or negative. So this is one of those at-home things, no cheating, all right? So here's the deal. Right now, I am buying a 90-strike call. The stock's at 90. What's the delta of the 90-strike call? We said that the delta of an at-the-money call is about what? It's about 50. Okay. And we also said that the delta of an out-of-the-money call is less than 50. Positive 50 here, aha, uh -huh. less than 50 and negative here because I sold the call. So are our deltas positive or negative? If you said positive, you are absolutely correct. How about that? All right, really, really good. 
How about this? How about gamma? We know now that we don't have to worry too much about gamma, but for the quiz, we also know that gamma is the change in delta, and when we buy options, we are positive gamma. When we sell options, we are negative gamma. Aha, and where's the most gamma? The most gamma is where the most time premium is. Another question, where's the most time premium? The most time premium is at the money. So I'm buying a lot of gamma here. I'm selling a little bit of gamma here. Is my gamma positive or negative? All right, there's the pause. If you said positive, you're absolutely right. All right, really good. All right, here's the next one. Vega, right? When I'm buying options, I'm buying Vega. When I'm selling options, I'm selling Vega. The question for you right now is, once again, see, it all comes back to these at-the-money options, right? And it all comes back to this time premium. Where's the most time premium? Because we know that's where the most Vega is. Well, the most time premium is at the money. That's what I'm buying. And the most Vega is at the money. How about that? So I'm buying a lot of Vega here. I'm selling a little bit less Vega here. So isn't it safe to say that I'm long Vega, long volatility with this spread? Yes, I am. And it's safe to say that an increase in volatility is going to help this position. All right, here we go again. Where's the most time premium? I'm trying to bang it home, everybody. The most time premium is where? Say it. If you say it loud enough, I can hear you all the way down this... Uh, the halls here, perhaps. Theta, the most theta, the most time decay is at the money, and I'm buying a lot of time decay. This is all time premium right here. This is going to be the largest theta, all right? Now, how about this? I'm selling theta, but the theta with the 90 call is a lot larger, a lot greater than the theta of the call that I'm selling. So, is time decay positive or negative? Put it this way, so you don't get confused with the plus sign and the minus sign. Is time decay coming into my account every day or going out of my account every day? If you said going out of your account every day, you are absolutely correct. So how about that little quiz? Did everybody pass and nobody cheated, right? Well, there's no cheating here, right? It's all good. All right. Now, just like the market makers, you guys better get a good grip on option pricing because that's what you want to take advantage of. And here's the quiz. Delta and gamma. Remember we said delta was going to be positive? Yep, there's the 50 delta at the money, roughly. Gamma's positive. Well, nets out to be zero. There's our vega. Ended up being positive. And time decays our enemy with this position, ending up in a negative slot. All right. Now, here we go. We're going to leave about 10 minutes or so with, for questions. Just a quick summary. Now you know you've got to have a forecast. And I'll tell you, option trading is the closest thing to professional sports. <laughs> because why? Because we're all competitive, right? We love this stuff. If you love it, if you don't like this, then I don't think this is for you, then you might want to find something else. But if you really like this and say, you know what, Peter, this has been really good, but I only got like 10% of what you said today, hang in there then. Give yourself a pat on the back. It's going to be okay because you know you've got a three-part forecast right now. You can take that away. Price, time, and volatility, and understand the effects of the Greeks for sure. Time decay is real. I've seen traders down here blow out with too much time premium around the 4th of July. I've seen traders blow out with too much volatility, and then we don't get volatility coming around for another nine months. All right? So time decay and volatility is real. Understand that when volatility goes up, Call and put prices go up, volatility down, call and put prices go down. So that's me, Peter Lusk. I want to thank you all for coming, and now I'm going to get to some of these questions, all right? Thanks for hanging on. There's a lot here. All right, let me try to thumb through these guys and see if I can find uh, a couple good questions to knock off here. Let's see. Okay, let's do this one here. Maybe I'm being greedy, but it seems that Vega and Theta are opposites. Is there a positive Vega and Theta position? Thanks. Well, this is a great question. Now, look, let me just try to make something up here with a little bit of a trade here so I can kind of help you out here. 
and this is uh, Robert, all right? If I buy options, I am long Vega, right? That means also that I've got a theta problem because theta is not my friend. So that's the deal. And your question is, is there a positive vega and a theta position? If I, if I, once again, if I buy an option, yep, I'm positive vega, I'm long vega, and I'm also going to be short theta. So, Robert, the answer to that would be no. Let's go with Stephanie here. Would you ever buy a call that has high implied volatility? Any unusual circumstances that would justify the higher price associated with the higher implied volatility? Well, this is a great question, Stephanie. Here's the deal with this one. When you're buying an option with high volatility, the expectation with implied volatility is for significant movement in the underlying. That's for sure, okay? That's the expectation. Are you going to get it? We just don't know. I'll tell you, there's a stock that I follow somewhat casually, and it's Alta. And Alta at earnings tends to have moves of about 16 to $20. And sometimes, Stephanie, the option that you buy, you know, these options sometimes are 14 15 bucks, just one direction, you know. And so now you need that stock just to get that far, to travel that far just to break even. So it's really a tricky game. So I've, that's the first part of the answer for me. Now, this is not a recommendation, but I tend to shy away from higher implied volatility. I'm more of a seller of implied volatility. Now, another consideration is this, Stephanie. Is, is Think about this. What if I buy the high implied vol and buy the straddle indicating how the expected movement might just play out? Maybe I sell another option. Let's talk calls up above. All right? Now we're in the game where we're actually spreading off that implied volatility to a certain degree, though, right? Spreading it off to a certain degree. That's how I can help you with that particular question. I hope it helps you anyway. All right. Thanks for the kind comments, Stephanie. Let's see what this one is. Good question by James. Is the volatility of the stock constantly changing? James, we wish it would. Us traders, we like changes in volatility. A lot of times we find ourselves just like the summer down here has been just terrible for the traders with the volatility just remaining constant. But volatility can change, like I said. Then it usually finds like a place where it kind of stops. James, remember the uh, remember the slide on implied volatility that I showed from the live vol slide? I could almost go back to it, couldn't I? Well, think of it this way. We had that big rise in implied volatility in advance of earnings because earnings are uncertainty. Then we got the crush, and then volatility just kind of settles and finds its own little spot, you know, up to maybe 20%, 22, back to 21. So it finds like a small range, all right? And it might sit there for a while, and then it might climb about four points. So it does move. It depends on what the underlying is. It certainly moves. All right, let's see if we can get to uh, a couple more here. Good question, though, James. I like that one. Look at this. What if I'm not good? This is another good question. This is Adrian. What if I'm not good at forecasting the price of the underlying? What strategy would you recommend to trade? Well, there's a bunch here. And this is, I could talk for this. This is such a good question. I could talk about this question for about a half hour. If there's a really dull stock that you follow, maybe you don't even have to pick a direction. But there's just enough stock, excuse me, there's just enough volatility to sell. So maybe this is a covered call type of strategy. Or maybe this is a, uh, an iron condor. Maybe I'm looking at a narrow range and I'm selling you know, near money calls and puts and buying out of the money calls and puts to kind of protect myself on a stock that doesn't have so much of a move on it. So maybe you're going to be that kind of trader that is looking to trade options on underlyings that have a narrow range, but just enough implied volatility to sell to make it worth your while? That's a great question. That's a very honest question. And you know what? I'm not the best forecaster for up or down either. That's really, really hard. You would think that it would be a 50% shot, but it's really about a 
<laughs> it's about a 10% shot sometimes for me, you know. I'm a little better at it when I've got more information like earnings. But again, just to summarize is that, uh, Adrian, maybe look and study a bunch of stocks that uh, don't move around too much and maybe you get into that premium selling mode, whether it be a covered call or maybe even a condor or an iron condor, maybe a butterfly, something like that. All right, let's see what else we got. Here's one uh, by Ken. The Greek's explanation is interesting, as is supply and demand, but isn't the price ultimately set by the options market makers, traders in the pit for the stock? Well, this is another one. Great question I could talk about for about a half hour, Ken. Certainly when new weekly options emerge or new monthly options emerge, the market makers know where to, where to set the prices. All right, but those prices are just a starting point. And I got some, oh, I could talk for this forever. Those are a starting point. But what really happens is things tend to change based upon supply and demand. Now, picture this. Picture some guy named John, who I know Mark knows, comes running across the floor at about 10 to 3, and he wants to buy 5,000 Apple call options. And the traders all say, sold, sold, sold. They all sell these call options at three bucks. And now broker John says, okay, great guys. I'm glad you filled me at, I'm glad you filled me at three. Where are you guys at now? I'm saying, look, I'll say a thousand. I'll say a thousand at 310. Another guy might say, I'll say a thousand more at 315. The underlying didn't even move based upon supply and demand. Yep, that option changed in price. So that's one way that we see it coming from the trading floor, you bet. The other way was my example coming from uh, the lady or the gentleman from Pocatello, Idaho. So that's the deal. Well, look, we hit our uh, our Cinderella time of 4.30. So I want to thank you all for, for having me in your offices or living rooms or whatever it might be. It means a lot to me. I like to share some of the knowledge that I've gained. The whole important thing for me, though, more than anything, is what would make me happy is to have you guys be successful because when you're successful, that means we trade more options here at the CBOE and everybody wins. That's really what it's all about. It's all about education and make sure that you continue to use the OIC website. It's a wealth of information. I might even go there sometimes. There's always room to learn in this business. Don't kid yourself. And keep in mind, my apologies that we didn't get to all the questions. That would have been a whole hour if we had to anyway. But as Mark said on the onset, they've got a, a nice team of very knowledgeable people at the OIC that I'm sure will get back to you in the next few days. So thanks, everybody. So long now. Hey, well, Peter, thank you so much. That was uh, that was fantastic. And as you can see by a lot of the comments coming in, people uh, – we're absolutely, uh, absolutely enraptured with your uh, presentation. Uh, a, a lot of thanks, a lot of compliments. So, thank you. That, that was fantastic. And. Ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to mention to you, uh, as Peter had noted, that our, our investor services team is going to be responding to all of the questions that you've asked, so keep, a, uh, keep an eye out in your inbox for those over the next couple of days. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter uh, at options underscore edu and like us on Facebook. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Peter, thank you as well. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, everybody, thank you for attending. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great evening.